Um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Sorry, we're just a couple of minutes late. Um, firstly, welcome uh, to today's session. Um, my name is Neve, and I'm the Research Officer at Fighting Blindness. And I just want to briefly go through a couple of housekeeping notes before we, we kick off the session. Um, so as you'll not have noticed, this webinar is hosted over the Zoom webinar function, which basically means that you can't turn on your camera or your mic throughout the course of the um, session. So if you do have any questions for any of the speakers at any point, if you want to pop them into the Q&A box, which you'll find down the bottom of your screen, um, that would be great. And also thanks to everyone who's submitted questions in advance. That's been really helpful. So we will try to address as, as many questions as we can today. And if not, we will try to follow up with everyone um, in the coming weeks. Um, so just a note that this webinar will be recorded. So if anyone needs to drop off early or if anyone that couldn't make it, we will be emailing the link to watch this back next week and it will also be available on our website. Um, I think that's it. I just want to thank our sponsors, Novartis, Roche and Bayer once again. And I'm just going to hand over to Kevin Whelan, who is the CEO of Fighting Blindness, to give the official welcome address. Thanks very much. Kevin, if you just want to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. There we go. Perfect. So uh, thanks very much, Neve. Uh, good evening, everybody. And it's great to welcome you to our third um, condition specific webinar. And as Neve said, we have some very excellent and interesting speakers uh, this evening. And what's particularly uh, noteworthy in terms of the people that will be presenting this evening is that each and every one of them are receiving funding support uh, from fighting blindness in terms of the research that they're undertaking. And I think it's a testament to the organization and its history of investing and nurturing uh, research that we actually have a succession and a legacy of people who are, um, and I can compliment them in terms of their youth, but also uh, despite our, our with their youth, they are very, well experienced and proficient researchers. So we're delighted uh, to have Dr. Sarah Doyle, Dr. Kirk Stevenson, and Professor Naomi Lois with us this evening to speak to us. And from the point of view of fighting blindness, I think it's been excellent that we've been able to facilitate these condition specific webinars because it is so important that people, uh, in spite of COVID, and the fact that we couldn't do it at our retina conference, it is great that we're able to communicate um, with people through this process, through this manner. And as we all say at all the condition specific webinars, good quality information is very empowering for people living with the conditions. So without further ado, I want to hand you back to Neve. Thank everybody for attending and hope that you find it both informative and uh, inspiring. And then just again, to thank our sponsors, because without them, these things can't happen. And we're very appreciative to Roche, Novartis and Bayer in that regard. So enjoy the, the uh, opportunity to hear the speakers and um, look forward to, to the content that they're going to provide. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so yeah, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker of the evening is Dr. Sarah Doyle. Um, who may be a familiar face to many people as she has presented at some of our previous Fighting Blindness events. Um, so Sarah is an Associate Professor in Immunology based in Trinity College Dublin and is doing a lot of great work on AMD mainly. So we're very looking forward to hear your talk today. If you want to share your screen whenever you're ready, Sarah. And just to mention, sorry, that some of the, if you do have a question, you can pick, um, your question can be anonymous and it only goes to the speakers. So if anyone has questions, please don't be, uh, don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A box. Thanks very much. Okay, Neve, can you hear me and can you see that? Yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant, that's great. Uh, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to um, speak today. Um, I was asked to give a research update and when I was considering what to show, I remembered that actually um, a couple of years ago at the last in-person um, Fighting Blindness uh, Public Day, that I was asked um, by one of the, uh, the members in the audience about dry AMD in particular and why we never hear much about research on dry AMD and it's always wet AMD. So I decided to take this opportunity to um, focus 
um, kind of a, a little bit more detail on some of the uh, research projects that we have up and running and um, that are currently ongoing um, in Trinity at the moment with a focus on dry AMD. Um, and then towards the end, I'll, um, I'll speak a bit about wet AMD as well. So as a preface to that, I should um, say, as Neve said, I am an associate professor of immunology. And so the immune system is really my first love. Um, and kind of, I just want to introduce the immune system a bit to you here so that you can kind of understand um, where uh, I'm coming from in some of the um, direction, research directions that we take. So uh, one of the things about the immune system is that it's really held in a very fine balance. Um, so we need our immune system to be activated and be able to be really activated to respond to infection. Um, but our immune system also responds to tissue damage um, and um, can be activated um, in, uh, in the absence of infection. And that's what we see in sterile diseases uh, such as retinal degeneration. But you know, due to this ability to really activate the immune system um, and uh, you know, its activity in being able to deal with um, highly infectious disease, um, the immune system itself can actually cause bystander tissue damage. And so that's why we have this really fine balance where um, there's checks in place to kind of you know, allow the immune system to be um, driven and to allow it to be inhibited. And so when we consider um, the immune system in retinal degeneration, we need to um, kind of I suppose, consider both aspects that in some cases we might need to actually promote immune pathways that might be useful for treatment of retinal degeneration and, you know, in, in kind of inducing a tissue healing um, route. And in others, we might actually need to inhibit the immune system um, and in order to slow down retinal degeneration so that we can kind of um, dampen down the bystander tissue damage. So just something to bear in mind um, as we go. And uh, the thing to remember is that the immune system is really there to maintain the status quo. So the topic um, of today is age-related macular degeneration or AMD. And um, age-related macular degeneration is a progressive um, blinding condition where the central vision starts to deteriorate. And that's because um, the very central part of the back of the retina um, is, is dying off slowly. And so you get this distortion in your vision. A few facts about AMD. It's um, a relative, it's not a rare disease. Um, there's almost 200 million people currently globally with AMD. Um, between 15 and 20 million Europeans are thought to have AMD. And we could actually fill Croke Park with the amount of Irish people that have AMD. So it's the leading cause of blindness in adults in industrialized countries. And age is um, the greatest risk factor, with one in 10 people um, at the age of 55 showing symptoms of AMD, rising to one in four people over 75, and two in three people um, over 90. So drusen are the first clinical signs of AMD, and that's um, these little yellow whitish deposits that are found centrally at the back of the eye. And I'm going to come back to these drusen later. So, um, We'll, we'll come back to that. But because the, of where the drusen appear, um, this is why it's the central vision that's actually lost in, in AMD. And if you can see this slide, um, what it's showing you is kind of a cross section of the back of the eye. And it really shows why um, drusen um, affects and distorts our vision because um, the the neural retina, the part of the eye that actually processes light into vision um, is, is really laminar structure. So it's layers and layers and layers of very, very delicate tissue. And so if you have um, like hills and valleys that are created by these deposits, then you're going to get wobbles in your vision. And ultimately what happens is that the cells overlying these drusen begin to degenerate and die away. So there are a number of different um, stages to AMD um, and it starts off as early dry AMD and AMD can then progress either into geographic atrophy um, or into wet AMD. So um, as many of you may know, there are a few current treatment options for dry AMD. Mostly people are told to um, stop smoking and enjoy a healthy lifestyle and 
um, take antioxidants. And so this brings me to kind of the first research story um, that we have to do with dry AMD. And this was um, a collaboration with um, TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, and it was carried out by Dr. Emma Connolly, who was a PhD student in my lab at the time. And really what Emma did was she looked at the relationship between smoking and AMD um, in this TILDA database, so in this Irish population. And she wanted to know whether, um, or you know, was smoking um, uh, enabling progression of AMD? And what we found was really quite striking that in Ireland, being a smoker doubles your risk of progressing, progressing to a later stage in AMD compared with being a non-smoker or a past smoker. Um, and we can see this here. So um, over in the never or past smoker panel, you can see that there's 22% of people have progressed to a later stage of AMD, whereas in fact, 16% of people have managed to regress to an earlier stage of AMD. Whereas if you are a current smoker, you can see that no one has regressed um, to an earlier stage of AMD. And in fact, 42% of people have progressed. So it's not just the doctors saying stop smoking because they think it's good for your health generally. Um, smoking is um, a bona fide risk factor for AMD. So this um, gave us kind of pause for thought and we wondered why does smoking have such an effect on AMD disease? And one of the things that we know smoking does is it increases reactive oxygen species. And um, these reactive oxygen species um, can basically strip um, uh, or change normal um, cell structures into something that doesn't look the same. And so if we think about it, actually a good analogy is um, what to see and to think about what oxygen does to iron. So if you have iron, and you um, out in the environment for too long, it turns to rust. And that's the oxygen working away um, at the iron, making it dysfunctional. And so um, in the same way, these oxygen species in our bodies can actually turn components of our cells and tissue into misfunctional um, co compounds. And it's not just smoking that can create these reactive oxygen species that do this but a, a Western diet and various different kind of variations in our genes can do, do have the same effect. So that led us to wonder um, in, 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 the, in, in an immunologist, as an, as an immunologist, this was very interesting because um, we know that these products that are generated um, because of the uh, reactive oxygen species are actually recognized by the immune system. Um, and the immune system is recognizing them as kind of damaged um, products. And so they need to be cleared. And um, in AMD, one of these oxidation products is particularly abundant. And um, these oxidation products, once they're recognized by um, the immune system, can increase inflammation and inflammation can cause tissue bystander damage. Um, so what we looked at was, or the questions that we asked um, was, can this um, oxidation product that's abundant in AMD uh, increase the inflammation in the eye? And could that possibly lead to the progression of AMD? And so um, Dr. Emma Ozaki, Kelly Mofall, and Kiva Brennan were all involved in this research. Um, and what I'm going to show you um, looks like a very busy slide, but in fact, Really, the take home message here is that in a healthy eye, uh, markers of inflammation are not found in the retina. And so the, this is actually post-mortem eye tissue donated by people with and without AMD. And um, in the purple staining, um, we, we are staining for a marker of inflammation. And in the um, non-diseased eye, we can see that um, there's no markers of inflammation, whereas in the AMD donor eye, we can see that there's a lot of purple staining, which is indicative of inflammation. So the next thing we did was we um, looked to see if we could introduce reactive oxygen species, these, these oxygen species that we know um, are induced by um, smoking, um, if we can kind of induce that in a mouse model. 
um, and what would happen there with the markers of inflammation. And so um, that's what we're seeing here. We can see that actually when we introduce reactive oxygen species in the mouse and look at the retina in the same way as we did in the human um, donor tissue, we can see this time in green staining the same um, markers of inflammation that we see in the human disease tissue. So this um, was all leading us down um, a kind of hypothesis that the oxidation product is able to drive inflammation um, and that that inflammation may be damaging um, in, in the eye. And so what was interesting is that from um, other disease models, we knew that this particular oxidation product could be recognized by this really beautiful looking um, immune complex here, which is, um, has the name TLR2. And TLR2 is known to drive inflammation. And so what we did was we, we did the same um, experiment where we introduced these reactive oxygen species into the eye, but we did this in a mouse that had no TLR2. So it didn't have the ability to recognize this oxidation product. And what you can see over here is that there is much less in the way of inflammation in this um, mouse when you don't have TLR2. And so um, kind of again, the take home message here was that um, if we were able to block this TLR2 pathway, um, we, could we prevent retinal degeneration in mice? And what we can see here is that using a kind of a, a therapeutic aspect um, to block TLR2, a neutralizing antibody, we can see that we actually protect um, the, the mouse from this reactive oxygen species induced um, retinal degeneration. So we think that blocking TLR2 may help protect the RPE from oxidative damage in AMD and this study is ongoing. So staying with dry AMD, um, I wanted to introduce the Irish Retinal Circadian Project, with, which is um, led by Professor Matthew Campbell and Mark Cahill, um, and uh, Dr. Natalie Hudson um, is the, the face of this project. Um, and to understand this Retinal Circadian Project, we need to uh, understand two more concepts. Uh, one is that um, there are two um, modes of blood vessels that feed the eye, that nourish the eye. And um, so this uh, neural retina that I spoke about, which is the, the part of the eye that actually processes um, light into vision, is kind of the ham and the sandwich between um, the choroidal blood vessels on one side and the retinal, the inner retinal blood vessels on the other side. And many of you may have heard about the choroid um, because this is the, these are the blood vessels that are, that are involved in wet AMD. However, um, there's very little information on the inner blood retinal um, vessels in, in AMD at all. Yet these are the vessels that are actually of interest to the Irish Retinal Circadian Project. And you'll see why in a minute. The other concept that's important for um, explaining this project is um, the body clock. So we've evolved to um, uh, live in a 24 hour cycle with kind of 12 hours of light and 12 hours of day. And um, our different biological processes are actually regulated by this body clock. Um, and so um, what um, Matthew Campbell um, found is that um, the inner retinal blood vessels, these blood vessels that are on the um, inner side of the, of the retina are actually leakier in the evening time in healthy eyes. And you can see that up here. Um, the, this is a person who has been injected with uh, fluorescein, which can leak out of the, um, the blood vessels. And you can see that in the morning time, it's cleared very quickly. And um, in the evening time, um, there is more uh, uh, vessel leakage. So this is normal and healthy and um, not something to worry about, and it likely helps clear waste from the eyes um, in the evening. But um, the question was asked, what happens if this goes awry? And so um, what the, these researchers, collaborators of mine have done is they have forced um, the inner retinal vasculature to be um, leaky, and um, they've looked to see what happens when that occurs. So this is kind of a pathological leakiness now, um, but and what you can actually see is that when these vessels are forced to be leaky, um, you get a 
breakdown in the outer retina, which is um, similar to what we see in age-related macular degeneration. So when these um, inner blood retinal vessels are forced to be consistently leaky, um, the result is this retinal degeneration that has an appearance of AMD. So the question that um, Matt and Mark um, are asking now is, is this circadian rhythm disrupted in people with AMD? And I would invite anyone who's interested um, in that project to go and look at this website here. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to wet AMD or choroidal neovascularization. So wet AMD is um, a second um, late stage of AMD um, and it's quite different to geographic atrophy. Um, and what happens here is that the vessels of the choroid actually break through um, the, the back of the eye and start to leak um, under the retina and they, they lift the retina um, and cause this um, uh, um, edema to form. So you get macular edema here and that um, can cause this vision loss. So um, the current treatment options for wet AMD are all really based around anti-VEGF therapy. And um, so you may have heard of Lucentis or Avastin or Ilea. Um, and these injections are given, you know, um, between four to six to eight weeks. And what they do is they soak up um, VEGF, which is a, a factor that um, allows these blood vessels to grow and they can stop the growth of the blood vessels and reduce the, um, the edema that has formed and you can um, improve uh, vision this way. However, alternatives are needed for this late stage of disease because unfortunately anti-VEGF therapy doesn't work for everyone and it can stop working for some people who it originally worked for. So you might remember I mentioned Drusen earlier on. Um, so a number of years ago, we were actually, when I was really learning about AMD myself, um, I wondered whether Drusen itself could be activating the immune response. And the reason for this was because if you look at other diseases of age and um, diet, like Alzheimer's, gout, atherosclerosis, or type two diabetes, all of these diseases are also associated with um, deposits. So amyloid, um, MSU, cholesterol crystals, or amylin. And these are all fairly similar to Drusen deposits and had been shown to activate the immune system to produce um, these chemicals that are called IL-1 and IL-18. So uh, to cut a long story short, we, we did show that Drusen could also have this effect and activate the immune response to induce these um, chemicals. So we wondered what effect that actually might be having um, in AMD pathology. Specifically, we were asking about wet AMD at the time. So we used a different mouse model. In this mouse model, um, you burn a laser um, hole at the back of the eye. And what that allows is for the choroidal vasculature to grow in and leak um, in the same way, um, modeling the human um, uh, wet AMD. And uh, Lucia Chalkova um, did an awful lot of this work. And I'm cutting uh, a number of years work into one slide here when I say that the take home message here really is that um, what we showed is that IL-18 administration prevents vascular leakage in mice. And so we can see that here um, in kind of the control animals, um, you get these big um, lesions that are leaking fluorescein and uh, with IL-18, the lesions are much less. So that indicates that um, the, the vascular leakage is, um, is lessened. So IL-18 is preventing this. And in fact, we were lucky enough to work with GSK at the time um, to see if IL-18 could um, possibly be used as a therapeutic. And so we were able to bring IL-18 into macaques, into a non-human primate study. Um, and uh, using this model with the laser burns, um, you can see that over time, um, the uh, fluorescein is leaking out of these burns. Um, whereas with Lucentis, which is your anti-VEGF therapy, you don't get that leakage. So the anti-VEGF is working in this model. And when we look at IL-18, we can see that um, IL-18 is also uh, preventing this um, vessel leakage 
um, uh, in, in this non-human primate model. So really what we were aiming to do here is to harness this kind of healing power of the immune system for wet AMD, because we had a danger signal in the form of drusen, which will activate um, the immune system to produce these chemicals, IL-1 and IL-18. And it appears that IL-18 has this wound healing process. And so by just introducing IL-18 alone, we're trying to kind of harness that wound healing uh, for the prevention of further disease. And the idea would be that this would um, complement anti-VEGF therapy um, for people who, where anti-VEGF therapy alone isn't enough. And again, this is ongoing work. So um, some of you may have been told that um, anti-VEGF therapy isn't going to work for you anymore. And this is possibly because um, of subretinal fibrosis. And fibrosis is really the, the um, main cause of vision loss in neovascular AMD. Um, and about 50% of people with, um, who are being treated with anti-VEGF often have this, this fibrotic scar tissue even after two years of treatment. Um, so I'm not going to go into the actual um, uh, projects that are going on in fibrosis, but um, it's a very hot topic at the moment in, um, in the AMD field, and uh, we are also studying it. So just to summarize, um, I hope that I have uh, given a good overview that the research landscape in retinal disease in Ireland is vibrant. Um, and that research is ongoing into the causes that may underlie progression to dry AMD um, with the aim to identify new therapeutic targets. Um, research is also underway to support anti-VEGF therapies for wet AMD and um, subretinal fibrosis um, has become of, of interest to, uh, to researchers in AMD as well. And just finally, to thank all the people who may have been participants already in the IORCP. Uh, so these are many of the people who would be involved in these projects. Um, and thank you for your attention. Great, Sarah, thanks a minute. That was great. A lot of, a lot of very interesting work going on. Um, just one of the questions that came in is, um, as one of the first signs of AMD Drusen, what exactly is it and kind of what exactly causes it? <laughs> yeah. That's a, it's a million dollar question. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, what it is, is um, a mix of proteins and lipids, um, and really it's thought, and because this is a, an excellent question, because we don't know the answer to that yet, why, why it gathers there, there is not understood. Um, it is thought that the um, cells in the eye are no longer um, able to deal with the waste anymore, and so they're kind of just dumping the waste out um, and that's what ends up being drusen rather than being able to kind of clear it out and um, into the bloodstream uh, and it, through the kidneys and out in that way. Okay thanks a lot and just a more a more general question as well that is kind of in your opinion maybe what's the most promising kind of bit of AMD research going on at the minute that you think might have the most impact for patients down the line or I mean that's a very general but a very general question yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think that if we can understand what's causing AMD, that that will have the most impact because we'll be able to actually treat the, um, the underlying cause rather than just the symptoms. At the moment, the only thing that's being treated is the symptoms, and that mm -hmm. means that the disease is progressing anyway. And um, so if we can really understand the underlying cause of the early dry AMD, then that will have the most impact because it will stop um, people progressing to the later forms, whether it be geographic atrophy or wet AMD. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I think we're perfectly on time, but probably don't have any, I don't see any more questions coming in, but I know, I think Sarah kindly said that if there is any questions that come in over the couple of weeks, we can pass them along and we can get back to people um, in the next yeah. few weeks, if that's okay. Yeah. No okay, problem. great. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, very Sarah. Much. That was brilliant. Cheers. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, um, so our next speaker today is um, Dr. Kirk Stevenson. Um, so Kirk is one of Fighting Blindness funded researchers also, and he is an ophthalmology resident based in the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital in Dublin. Um, he's going to talk to us a bit more about the clinical side on AMD and geographic atrophy. Um, thanks for being Kirk and welcome. Uh, we can see your screen, that looks good to me anyway. 
Great, thanks a million, Neve and Kevin and all of Fighting Blindness for the invitation to speak today. Um, I would say that I've met a lot of the people who are logged on today, so it's just a shame that we can't see each other face to face, but hopefully someday soon. Um, I'm going to speak to you this evening a little bit about macular degeneration and geographic atrophy, this time more from a clinical point of view. Sarah gave a very uh, comprehensive talk on the underlying uh, processes that are causing what we think is, is causing macular degeneration, uh, as well as some of the new treatments, which is brilliant. And I myself learned a few things there. So thanks, Sarah. Um, so let's see, can I get my slides to work? Here we go. So just a brief outline. Um, we're going to go through some basic anatomy here in terms that I can understand and uh, that might clarify what we're talking about. Then just touch on what macular degeneration is and hopefully expand on some of what uh, Sarah was going through, uh, as well as the current treatments and some things on the horizon. And then we'll briefly touch on some other types of macular degeneration. And I've got quite a few uh, questions from the audience, so hopefully I can get through some of this and then um, directly answer those, because I'd say a lot of people have very similar experience and uh, that may be as helpful, if not more so, than what I've prepared. So what are we looking at with the eye here? Can everyone see my mouse okay? Or do I need a special pointer? No, I can see the mouse, all right. Perfect. So let's keep it simple. The eye is basically a camera. You've got a lens at the front and that's composed of a few uh, specific parts, the cornea and the, what's called the lens. And the job of that is to focus light onto the back of the eye, the retina, in particular interest today, the macula. So here's a picture of a camera where it's in similar orientation. You've got a lens at the front and you've got a film at the back. And I think it even highlighted these similar features. Just keep it simple and that way we can, um, can focus in then. So we're not gonna talk about problems with the cornea or the lens in particular today. That would be things like corneal scars or cataract, which are very important topics as well, uh, but just on the back of the eye. So the front of the eye focuses light and it is dependent on the retina and the macula to be able to recognize that light, turn it into an, a nerve signal and send that signal back to your brain. And that's a three-step process in simplified terms. So you're turning light energy via a chemical reaction into electrical signal that your brain is able to interpret uh, as vision. So here's another diagram here of the uh, light actually entering the eye, the way the light focuses it down to a very specific pinpoint on the center of your macula, a spot called the fovea, in a similar way to how a camera focuses it down. All right, so here's a wide field picture of the back of someone's right eye. This is what we see when we look into your eye and what we're checking, tell if someone has macular degeneration or any other conditions, or if they have a, a nice healthy eye. Uh, and there's four main structures we look at. So the peripheral retina all around here, the blood vessels, to make sure that they have good blood supply. And Professor Lois is going to be speaking about that area in detail with her diabetic retinopathy talk. The optic nerve, which is, you're looking at the front of this circle, which is a nerve that connects your eye back to the brain and back to the computer and that, or the camera analogy, that's like connecting the uh, digital camera to your computer to get the pictures off it. And then the area that we're interested in today is the macula. So this is responsible for your central vision. And you might be familiar with rods and cones, uh, rods being responsible for your dim light vision and movement and cones being uh, in charge of your color vision as well as the sharp vision. Now, there's cones all over the retina, but they're in the highest concentration in the dead center. Uh, this is a, a more focused view out to about 50 degrees where we're looking at the optic nerve again, the blood vessels. And you can see this darker area in the center. This is the normal pigment of the macula um, that helps in preventing light from scattering and causing glare, as well as um, protecting the photoreceptors there from uh, damage. Now, we have other scans that we use. This one in particular is very um, effective and it's changed the way that we look at the, the retina. This is called an OCT or optical coherence tomography in its full form. And basically you can see all these different layers here. It's showing the, the nerve layers that are then connecting back to that optic nerve. And the picture on the right here is showing all the different cell types here. So you have things like the cone cells, the rod cells, and then your bipolar ganglion cells and other accessory cells, which are critical to, um, to vision. And what we're focused on in macular degeneration is this outer layer here, these several white and black lines, which represent the photoreceptors 
they're the cells that turn light into an electrical nerve signal via a chemical reaction. And there's another equally important layer that's right next to them, and that's called the retinal pigment epithelium. And this is the workhorse. This is the part of the eye, the cells that are making the eye sensitive to light again. Because a chemical reaction is like turning on a switch and that sends the signal. But you have to make the switch sensitive again. So you turn it back into the position that light is now able to, uh, to cause vision again. And this process takes energy, the retina actually consuming the most energy out of any part of the body, uh, including the heart and the brain, and um, is constantly metabolically active. And one of the components we think of what's in drusen, which are the hallmark of, macular, of dry macular degeneration, are some of these metabolic waste products um, that build up. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. So a little bit about function. Um, there's this complicated chemical pathway here. This is just part of it here, the uh, retinoid cycle and phototransduction. And it just shows all of the different processes going on within the photoreceptors. So these are your rods and cones. And then within the retinal pigment epithelium, to enable you to have vision. So what's AMD? Um, well, it's in the name that age is the number one risk factor. And as Sarah very clearly showed there, um, it becomes more common or more prevalent as people age. So in the group over 50 from that tilde study, in total, 7.2% of people had signs of macular degeneration. This doesn't mean that everybody had symptoms. And, some of them would have been completely asymptomatic and unlikely to be detected if, um, if they weren't being examined for the, um, for the study. And then as people became older, over 75, there was, um, I think, 14% of the population or more are affected by AMD. But there's two types that most of you will be familiar with. There's dry macular degeneration, which makes up the majority, and that's 90% approximately, and then wet macular degeneration. So dry AMD, um, we'll go into in one second, but the, the risk factors that I think I have the same exact picture that Sarah had because it's so critical that smoking is one of the most uh, detrimental things you can add into the equation when you are um, diagnosed with macular degeneration. So stopping smoking is, is critical. Um, there's nothing we can do about age, unfortunately. And when we discover that, we'll be able to fund all of our research projects with the money we make off that. Um, and then family history as well. There's nothing you can do about your genetics for the most part at the moment, um, but there may be a strong family history of, um, of macular degeneration. Um, there is also some evidence to show that people being overweight or having cardiovascular disease, such as high blood pressure, may be at greater risk of developing the uh, wet form of macular degeneration. So here's a familiar looking picture of dry AMD and drusen are the hallmark of that condition. The drusen are these yellowish um, deposits at the level of the RP in the outer retina. So when we look at the color picture and then have a, a scan of a similar person, uh, you can see these extra additional areas that are, that are bright. And that's new material that's been deposited there, uh, which is typical of drusen. And in this, these products, this is what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned that there's a chemical process that's creating vision. And this RPE is constantly working to remove those metabolic products that, that are created. Um, it's like uh, analogous to breathing. So you, you need oxygen to, uh, to function, to provide energy for your cells. But then as you breathe out, you're removing carbon dioxide from the system. And normally there's a balance of in and out. With this, these products start to build up and they become toxic to the surrounding retina. And uh, that then harms both the RPE and the photoreceptors that uh, once they're under stress, the cycle continues to build up more waste products, not be able to remove them. And that's why this starts to develop as a, what's called geographic atrophy or a patch in the center. And why does it happen in the center? Well, I think that's the area doing the most work. So it tends to build up uh, where the light is focused at the back of the eye. Uh, one of the common tests we do for dry macular degeneration and wet is this thing called an Amsler grid, um, which is a, a page with, with a grid on it. And this is an artist's rendition of what someone who has distortion might, uh, might see. And uh, in some cases, people don't see obvious distortion because dry macular degeneration comes on rather slowly in most cases until it starts to affect that very center part of your vision. Um, but checking each eye on its own with an Amsler grid 
for example, once a week is a good way to detect any changes. So you know if you need to, uh, to check in with your doctor. But some people may just notice blurring uh, and it may be worse in one eye than the other. So the better seeing eye might mask the problem um, as we normally are working with both eyes uh, together and only when the better seeing eye is covered, uh, someone might notice that they're not seeing as well. Um, in the more advanced stages of dry macular degeneration, you can see the drusen still here in the peripheral area. There's the optic nerve, there's the center of your vision, and this pale, fairly well-defined area is called geographic atrophy. It's like a map um, of, say, an island or a, a body of water that's just missing. And when we do a scan through that with our OCT scan, you can see that all of these nice layers that represent the photoreceptors and the RP, they're okay outside of the center, but once you come in, you can almost see this layer diving down, but those layers are actually just missing, and more so in some areas, different patches than others, which you might see in this picture in the left, where there's one more severely affected area and another that's, um, that's doing a bit better. And um, this is a sign of atrophy, where the cells have become tired and damaged from the, uh, the waste products that have built up next to it, and, um, and have slowly died, some of those cells, unfortunately. So this is why treatments like injections, which we'll get into in a moment, wouldn't work for this condition, because the injections stop fluid from leaking. And in this case, there is not any fluid to treat, unfortunately. So that brings us on to wet macular de degeneration, also known as exudative or neovascular. And in this picture here, you can see the right eye of someone who has the hallmark feature of AMD, which is drusen, and also this red area here that's well circumscribed close to the center vision uh, that represents hemorrhage. And this can be a fairly subtle version like this picture, or it can come on in a much more dramatic way or if there's delayed presentation with a large area of what's called subretinal hemorrhage. And both these people might notice a sudden change in their vision, either distortion or uh, reduced um, visual acuity or ability to see the smaller letters on the chart. Uh, OCT scan of wet AMD shows here at the top is a normal um, scan, just showing all of the layers as we expect. Where in wet AMD, we see that there is a, a new blood vessel underneath the retina, what we assume to be a new blood vessel, and, uh, and swelling or edema around it with signs of exudate, which is some cholesterol or lipid that's come out of it. There's a newer imaging test called OCT angiography that doesn't involve any dye intravenously or through the vein, um, but can show us via techniques of checking on how the blood cells are moving if there's blood vessels where there shouldn't be. So this layer is surrounded by black, because this is what's called an avascular layer, where there shouldn't be any blood vessels. And it, this test was able to detect this network of uh, abnormal blood vessels there, which is consistent with, macular, with wet macular degeneration. Uh, the gold standard test is something called fluorescein angiography, which some of you might have had, and that is um, where we put a, a small needle in the arm and inject a, a yellow dye and take pictures of the back of the eye as this comes through to see is there a leaking blood vessel that would be um, amenable to treatment. So here we can see someone's eye with a slightly distorted reflex and some hemorrhage beside the macula, and in the early phases it's dark. Now this may not project very well, so apologies if it doesn't. Um, and the dark area represents that blood and swelling is masking the underlying um, leaking blood vessel. But as we progress along from 22 seconds to 36 to out to nearly five minutes, we can see that the area is getting brighter and bigger, which is a sign that this fluorescein is leaking and it confirms the diagnosis of wet AMD. So just looking at the advanced forms of macular degeneration, on the left side of the screen, we see someone with geographic atrophy, which is an advanced form of dry macular degeneration. On, on the right side, there is this whitish area of subretinal scarring that is um, a more severe form of chronic uh, wet macular degeneration. And what someone might see here is the um, expected picture on the left. And then on the right, there's a, either a distorted or a missing area in the center. So what are the treatments? Well, Sarah went through the treatments for dry macular degeneration and the trials for these uh, new treatments have not given us the, uh, the answers we were hoping for. And at present, the best treatment is stop smoking. And there are certain uh, dietary supplements that some of you have been asking about in, in the comments and we'll get to those. 
of what, uh, what the best supplements are. And there's a study called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study, uh, part one and two, uh, that defined what the best combination of ingredients was to reduce the risk of progression. And in the ARIDS-1 study, it showed that the chance of progressing from early detectable AMD to advanced AMD, either the wet uh, scar or the dry geographic atrophy, was reduced by 25% by taking this combination, which includes in the, the current recommendations, uh, certain dose of vitamins C and E, zinc and copper, as well as lutein and zeaxanthin. And I believe the, the closest we have to this exact formula is Maca Shield Gold at the moment, but there's always um, someone coming up with a new um, formula that may be a slightly better value as well, we can hope. So treatments for wet macular degeneration there have been a number of uh, approaches over the, the last 20 years or so, um, because this is a very devastating problem if it goes untreated. Uh, you can go to bed with normal vision and wake up with a new change of distortion. And if treatment is not started within a relatively short period of time, it can lead to um, slower recovery um, so initial treatments involved laser, where using the fluorescein test, the dye test, we looked for a leaking blood vessel. And if it wasn't in the most sensitive central spot, we tried to treat that with laser. It was only possible for a minority of people and, um, and it wasn't as effective as we like. Then there was a type of what's called cold laser. You put a different dye through the, the vein on the arm and then use a special type of light to activate that at the back of the eye. And that, that is effective for this, but it has some side effects of promoting geographic atrophy in certain situations. And then the current gold standard is uh, injections of a medication called anti-VEGF, it's vascular endothelial growth factor. And this was developed or recognized as a side effect of people receiving treatment for um, colon cancer, where a medication was given through the vein to shrink blood vessels in their, in their bowel. And uh, it was noted that people that had macular degeneration, there was some improvement. So a lot of uh, investment in research and clinical trials uh, showed that by giving this medication into the eye, we were able to shrink the blood vessels. And earlier treatment um, logically gave better outcomes. Some of the names you might be familiar with are Lucentis, which is a uh, proper name is Ranibizumab, Avastin, which is likely the most commonly used in Ireland and most parts of the world, um, Ilea, which is Flipperceps and a newer medication called Bayaview, which is Rolosizumab. And here's just a diagram. Um, I kept it to just a black and white color one because nobody needs to see that. Um, but it isn't a, a sort of procedure. Um, and when people come back for their second procedure, for the most part, they're much more relaxed because they say it wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. But uh, I think there's a, there's a large part of it that's the thought of it. These treatments are very effective. Um, now, there's other treatments that don't directly involve treating the macular degeneration, and these are very important. These are things like correcting someone's uh, need for glasses if they're short-sighted or long-sighted, ensuring that they have very good lighting. So this is an area where the macula is under stress, so it needs to have better focus and better light uh, reaching it to give you the best level of vision. So glasses and having a reading lamp coming from behind is quite important, as well as magnifiers. And there's a few different types that are low tech handheld ones, table mounted, closed circuit television, um, and then electronic things like Kindle and, and so on. And then also checking for the health of the rest of the eye, things such as cataract, which may um, improve vision if they're treated. So there's a few new treatments that are under investigation in clinical trials. And one of them is a fairly simple idea. That's the port delivery systems. So it still involves giving the same medication, the anti-VEGF, uh, but it involves a procedure the first time someone uh, is diagnosed where a, a special device like a reservoir is, is added to the eye. So that instead of someone needing an injection every month, every six weeks or so, they would uh, hopefully only need a, a top up every six months and then this medication would slowly be released. So early results are promising, um, but we're still waiting for the more advanced clinical trials. We remain hopeful. It's be good for everyone who's affected by this, as well as all of the hospitals and healthcare facilities. Um, there are intraocular magnifiers. This is one example here. You can see that um, there's a new lens put in the eye in place of someone's cataract. 
and this focuses light onto a wider area at the back of the eye. So it literally blows up the picture so that if someone is missing the very center, for example, looking at my face, you might be missing my eyes and nose and mouth. By using this, it might magnify the image so that only the end of my nose is missing, which can have uh, significant functional benefits. But once again, it's not treating the macular degeneration. It's trying to bypass the problem in a stable situation. And then there is some work going on in America and California, as well as in London, with the London Project to Cure Blindness uh, for stem cells. This is something that would be most effective for people that have geographic atrophy, where the photoreceptor cells and the RPE cells at the back of the eye have become damaged or died over time. Um, and this is to try to replace the cells. And work, uh, early work was reported on this um, about two years ago, uh, but we're still waiting for more um, advanced clinical trials that show the safety of this, as well as the long-term effect to, uh, to ensure that this will work. But at the moment, this isn't available, at least in Ireland. Um, but as these new treatments do progress, we will be in contact with yourselves through either the clinic that you attend um, or through uh, groups such as Fighting Blindness that will um, we'll try and keep you up to speed with any new developments. So how effective is treatment? The current treatment for dry macular degeneration, the um, ARIDS-2 formula is aimed to reduce the loss of vision by 25% or reduce the progression to severe disease. Whereas the treatment for wet AMD, um, the goal is really to keep the vision stable at the very least, and that's successful in 85 to 90% of people, whereas there may be improvement in up to a third of people. And we don't know necessarily who will improve uh, when we first see someone and, and give the diagnosis of macular degeneration until the treatment has been given. So what does that mean? If someone started out with vision on the top line of the chart, what we call 660, and they improved by one, two, three lines, they'd be down to this level here of about 618. And where does that stand? What does that even mean? Well, the next line down is called 612, and that is typically the standard you need to see at least that well in your better seeing eye to drive a car. And then 2020 vision is down here at the bottom of the chart. So although there is significant improvement in some people, uh, by about three lines of vision, um, it doesn't guarantee vision returning back to our very best level, unfortunately. Now, people may require ongoing in injections, and there are a number of different strategies to, to give this um, maximum benefit from these treatments. Some people need a treatment every month. Some people, it's every six or eight weeks. And then there's also treat and extend protocols where based on checking someone's vision, doing the OCT of the back of the eye, and, uh, and monitoring very closely, you can extend someone's treatment out to even longer intervals, like eight, 10 or 12 weeks. But this is um, a minority of people, um, but it does reduce the burden on someone receiving injections, as well as making things safer um, from a risk point of view. The main risk of an injection is you're putting something into the eye is a rare risk of causing an infection, which is somewhere between one in a thousand chance or, and one in 2000 chance, but it does happen, unfortunately. However, the, the benefit from these treatments is, is much higher than the risk. So I said I was gonna talk briefly about other macular degenerations. This is literally two or three minutes. Um, some people may uh, find that they, they sound familiar here and they, they fit into one of these categories, but sometimes there's a bit of overlap. So myopic macular degeneration is another condition we see um, less, much less frequently than, than age-related. And it's in people that are typically high short-sighted, they're highly myopic. So this is um, minus six or more. They tend to be at a younger age and there can be dry or wet forms, just like age-related macular degeneration. And the response to injections may be slightly better. The reason people get this is because they have the same amount of eye tissue, but it's stretched over a bigger space. So some of the tissues are more vulnerable at those highly active spots like the macula. Uh, there's uh, what's near and dear to my heart is the inherited retinal degenerations that fighting blindness have um, walked with me uh, the whole every step of the way to develop a uh, new diagnosis and treatment. A uh, very common version of that is something called Stargardt disease that's caused by a genetic mutation or genetic variant that leads to a type of macular degeneration that uh, affects young people anywhere from five years of age um, up to 30s or 40s. Um, so it's, it's a similar problem without the wet form uh, in most cases uh, that 
um, is currently currently has no effective treatment, but a lot of work is going into it. In uh, but that's for another day. And then other causes, uh, rarer things again, uh, chronic inflammation. And somebody did mention that there was a history of uh, an inflammatory condition. If this affects the eyes with inflammation, you can develop an inflammatory new blood vessel at the back of the eye. Uh, diabetes can cause different problems at the back of the eye, but may end up giving you similar visual issues. Um, blockages of blood vessels like arteries and veins at the back of the eye may also cause the same problems uh, and treatments may be different. And this is a picture of someone who's had a nasty injury to the eye where uh, there's been a break in one of the layers and some new blood vessels have formed as part of the body's attempt to heal the problem, but it's caused more harm than good. So in summary, AMD is the most common cause of visual loss in the aging population in the developed world. Detection is important. So symptoms of distortion would be classic using something like an hamster grid and having regular checkups with your local eye care provider, whether that's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. Um, and then the treatment. So limited treatment so far for dry macular degeneration, but work ongoing. And uh, wet macular degeneration, there are effective treatments and earlier detection of symptoms and, and diagnosing the problem is better. And there are those new treatments that are very exciting in clinical trials. So we remain hopeful for progressing ever upwards. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kirk. That was great. Um, I think you have some of the questions and I think there was a lot that you did address as you went along, but do you want me to pull out a few or do you want to pick yeah, it up for yourself? Sure. And if you have them queued up, I'm just trying to track them on my phone here. Oh yeah, no worries, yeah. Um, so one of them was just maybe a bit relevant to COVID at the time, or COVID is that working from home and using smaller screens for up to eight hours a day um, and how that might affect, you know, AMD and in general eye health. And is there kind of a safe amount of hours to use these screens and mm -hmm. to delay? I yeah, delay a little AMD. guest there in the room. Um, I missed the first part of the question. Was it asking about screen time in regard to AMD? Yeah, in eye health and AMD probably in general, just to delay it if possible. Or is there a safe amount of hours that you should be on screen? Um, so there's there's a recent publication about blue light filters, and uh, this is kind of a, a hot topic, and, and people are worried that the lights are harming their eyes. Um, technically, the uh, macular degeneration is related to, to seeing, to light coming into your eyes over your entire lifespan. But uh, to my knowledge, blue light, um, and which is one of the types of light that comes from electronic screens, doesn't come any, uh, doesn't cause any uh, progression of macular degeneration, uh, but it can cause a different dry problem, dry eye, um, or it can irritate or, or flare up someone's eyes if they're very sensitive and they might have conditions like dry eyes or blepharitis. So we always recommend, um, you know, limiting your screen time and, and making sure you're using proper lubrication for your eyes. And uh, another thing that I can't go on about enough is hot compresses to your eyes. I think everybody should probably try it within reason uh, over your closed eyes, and that will normally improve the comfort of your eyes uh, in someone who's in dry eyes. Just a little plug. Thank you. And then there's a couple that came in the chat box just as you were speaking. One of them was, you kind of touched on it about the, what do you think of Bovu injections for wet AMD and the side effects? As you kind of well, did say. It's, it's yeah. a new medication, but along the same lines as the existing treatments for wet AMD. Um, we have some data on it that it is, it's no worse than the, the current options, but there have been uh, reports of inflammation caused by it. So uh, I'd reserve a, an ultimate judgment until we have a bit more information. But my personal mm -hmm. experience with it in the public system is, uh, is zero so far, just from reading the, uh, the data. Great, thanks. And just another one from the chat box is, is central scler sclerosis retinopathy often misdiagnosed as AMT, AMD? Or do you know? Yes, um, I, yeah. I saw that comment earlier. So yeah. CSR is, is a, it can have similar features. And uh, one of them is that there's fluid or swelling underneath the retina, but it tends to happen in a different group of people that are slightly younger. Um, they may be on medications, in, including steroids, whether that's a tablet, a skin cream, or uh, an inhaler or nasal spray. Um, and some people are just sensitive to these medications. Um, other people, if they're under a lot of stress at the moment, their bodies make steroid in response to that. And it can cause this uh, spontaneous leaking at the back of the eye. 
the change in vision tends to be less um, in acute CSR, where the, the vision is still quite good. And um, it often goes away on its own in up to 75% of people after a number of months. Whereas the opposite is true of macular degeneration, where if someone had wet AMD and they weren't seen to within three months, it may do some damage to the back of the eye. And the other thing is there's typically no drusen in, uh, in CSR. So the tests we do, the different scans, and you know, asking the right question should be able to tell them apart. But you know, not every case is as clear cut as, as that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Kirk. I think there is a couple of questions we didn't get to, but we hope to get back to people in the next couple of weeks. Or, um, yeah, of course. As Sarah yeah. said, if there questions, I'm happy to uh, do my best awesome. to answer them. Just yeah. Thanks, right. Thanks a million, Kirk. Yeah. Cheers for your time. I am. Okay. Um, so the next speaker we have is um, Professor Noemi Lois, um, who is a professor, clinical professor of ophthalmology based up in Belfast in Queen's University. And as far as I'm aware, I think this is the first time uh, you've spoken at an F uh, Fighting Blindness event. So we're really delighted to have you here today and hopefully the next time might be in person. Um, so Noemi is going to talk a little bit about diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. So. Thank you very much. It's no a pleasure problem. to be. Thank you very much. Good uh, to have you. you hear me well? Yep. Perfect. Really good. Thank you. Uh, no it's problem. a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, I was hoping I would make it on time because I uh, just left the hospital and came to the talk. I was getting ready, but I, I was uh, funny, funny enough. I was, you know, no problem. I, I managed to make it on time. So um, I'm going to just. Um, you let me know if you can see my screen now. Yep, that looks good. Great. Excellent, so thank you. So I'll start. So yes, indeed, I'm going to talk to you today about diabetic retinopathy. A, uh, some of you here today might have uh, diabetes. Some of you may or might not have uh, diabetic retinopathy. But what is it? What I'd like to try to do during the next probably 20, 25 minutes is to give you an overview of what diabetic retinopathy is. Uh, I'll talk to you about diabetic macular edema and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I'm going to refer to as DMO and PDR, or I will spell it all. It's difficult to remember all these abbreviations that we use, so I'll try to explain everything. So um, these are the two complications of diabetic retinopathy, and as I'll explain to you, these are the causes of sight loss in people that have diabetic retinopathy. And as I'm doing that, I would like to um, give you an overview of some of the work that we are doing. I'm working at the Wellcome Wilson Institute for Experimental Medicine at the uh, Queen's University in Belfast. A, um, and so I will uh, explain to you as we go along what a uh, few projects that we are undertaking here so that you have a taste of what we do in the north part of Ireland. So, what is diabetic retinopathy? Well, diabetic retinopathy we call uh, uh, to those changes that we can see in the back of the eye of people that have diabetes. Sooner or later, everyone that has diabetes will develop diabetic retinopathy. And we say that it just changes uh, over time and it uh, advances through different stages. So at the beginning, somebody that has just recently diagnosed diabetes, most of the times there's no changes in the back of the eye. So you have seen several pictures today of uh, the back of the eye that was sh shown to you by Kirk and, and, and Sarah. And so this is another one. Hey, can you see my... center of the retina, which we call the fovea, and that's the area of maximal vision. So this is a normal uh, back of the eye, so there's no changes. But this patient had diabetes. But again, it was early, so there were no changes present. As the disease progresses, then there's little changes. It's hard to see here because my picture is not too small, but hopefully you can see little dots that look red. So some of these are hemorrhages in the back of the eye. Some of these might be areas on the blood vessels that become a little bit uh, dilated. 
like it will happen in a hemorrhoid, uh, if you uh, know what those are, or, or like it will happen in an aneurysm. And we call them micro aneurysms because they are very minuscule, very small. So these are changes that we see when people have mild, what we call non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So from no changes to mild changes. Then as the disease progresses, we see more changes and you can see them here, more little hemorrhages, more microaneurysms, and then you can see these white areas in the back of the eye that are like areas where a, uh, there's uh, an infarct. But as it happens in a stroke, it would be little areas of a stroke in the retina, very, very small ones. And then we call it moderate. So it just goes progressing mild, moderate. The next step would be severe, as you can see many more changes. And that will go, if it keeps progressing, it keeps progressing, it will go in what we call proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And I'll explain to you a little bit later on what that is. Also, at any stage, diabetic macular edema, and I'll explain to you also what this is, can occur. So diabetic macular edema can occur at any point on this um, uh, different type of uh, stages of disease. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy usually happens after several years, once people have kept getting worse and worse, and the, the, the diabetic retinopathy, you know, worsen over time. Now, it's intriguing because not all people that have diabetes and develop diabetic retinopathy will develop diabetic macular edema or will develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So many people go through lives with diabetic, macular, uh, with diabetic retinopathy and never develop macular edema or proliferative disease. And they never have any problems with their sight. So diabetic retinopathy, those changes that I showed you per se, do not cause visual loss. But the complications of diabetic retinopathy, as I mentioned to you, diabetic macular edema or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, can lead to sight loss. So I'm going to just take you through, I'm going to start with diabetic retinopathy. What can we do for diabetic retinopathy? Well, the main thing, as I mentioned to you, if you just have diabetic retinopathy, but you don't have the complications, you don't have diabetic macular edema, you don't have proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you don't have sight loss. So any treatment would be to try to prevent you from developing these complications. So what can we do to prevent them? Well, we know that these complications tend to happen in people that have high levels of sugar. So people that have diabetes and their sugars are not very well controlled. The risk would be higher for them to develop these two complications. A lot of people with diabetes will have blood pressure problems. So their blood pressure would be high. And again, if your blood pressure is high, there's more chance for you to have diabetic macular edema or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And if your lipids, that means cholesterol, triglycerides, if they are high in your blood, then again, there's more risk. So we say, well, we can prevent these complications if we treat and make sure that all these things are well controlled. This triad that we call, um, oh, it's very important that we make sure that every patient has this well controlled as best as possible. And we know that that is not very easy to do. And some people still try their best and still their sugars might be high. So what else can we do to prevent? Where there was two trials, two large trials, Field and Accor, they were actually investigating the risk of people having heart disease as a result of diabetes. And other complications, they look at many other complications that can occur in people that have diabetes. They use both of these trials, the same drug, but the dose was slightly different, but the drug was called phenofibrate, phenofibrate. So one of the things that they looked at, they looked at diabetic retinopathy, although that was not the primary reason for the research, but they were looking at the retina. And they saw both trials, a phenofibrate produced the risk of progression of the retinopathy in people that have some degree of retinopathy. People that have mild retinopathy progress less. So it seemed to suggest that phenofibrit is helpful. But because these trials were not done specifically to look at retinopathy, then you know 
people are not really knowing for sure that this treatment is helpful. So at the moment, there is a trial in Scotland going on, looking specifically at retinopathy in people that are taking phenofibrate. So hopefully, this trial will give us some results as to whether or not we should be prescribing this treatment for people with diabetes to reduce the risk of developing proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. In some countries like Australia and uh, uh, Malaysia, in um, um, other places, Indonesia, they actually, this treatment is approved uh, for the treatment of retinopathy. But here in UK, we are, uh, and in Ireland, we are not using it regularly. So I'm gonna go now and talk to you about diabetic macular edema, which is one of the complications I mentioned to you that can cause eye loss in people with diabetes. What is diabetic macular edema? Diabetic macular edema is the accumulation of fluid. It can be also lipid, meaning cholesterol, triglycerides coming out of the blood vessels and going into the retina or blood at the macula, which as you heard and you see, you saw in previous lectures, is the center of the retina. Again, here I'm showing you a picture of the back of the eye with the nerve here, the blood vessels. This would be the central area in the back of the eye. That would be the macula. This would be the very center, the fovea, which we call, this is the area of maximal vision. And this eye is healthy, it has no disease. So when we look at the back of the eye, you, if you have had your eyes checked, you know that we look through a machine, which is we call a slit lamp, and we have a lens in our hand to look at the back of the eye so that we can see the retina. And this is what we see when we look through this machine. And so this patient has diabetic macular edema. And what do we see? A little bit of what I was telling you before, some hemorrhaging, some would be round micro aneurysms. I was telling you dilations in the blood vessels. And you see this yellow material. It might remind you of the drusen that you saw in previous slides, but this is actually a um, lipid that came out of the blood vessels, fat that came out of the blood vessels. And the fat is yellow. So it looks yellow in the back of the eye. And when we do a scan with a technical optical coherence tomography, OCT, you heard about it also because Kurt was mentioning it. So when we do a scan through here, right? It's like doing a section through the retina. We can see when you have no disease, this is how it should look. You, we should have a little depression a little area that it looks thinner in the center. That's the area of maximal sight that we have in our retina. But look at the comparison. This is a patient with diabetic macular edema. Instead, it's kind of like protrudes and you can see it looks black rather than looking like this because this is all filled with fluid, the fluid that came out through the blood vessels. So the fluid goes out of the blood vessels because the blood vessels leak. Yes, similar to what Kirk was telling us that it happens in uh, people with exudative age-related macular degeneration. So on here, the blood vessels are within the retina. So they are the normal blood vessels, but they are weak. So they leak the fluid and it goes into the retina. So we heard also Kirk saying that we can do another test that is very useful, which is fluorescing angiogram. You can see here we're injecting the dye the dye is called fluorescein. It goes into the vessel in the arm and then right go into the eye. And as it travels in the eye, it just lights the blood vessels up white. So you can see this is the dye in the blood vessels. It shows also all the microaneurysms that are the dilations in the blood vessels. So they take up the dye. And then the blood vessels are weak. So they leak the dye out and you can see all the dye white leaking out of the blood vessels. This is very useful and it's also very useful because we can see the blood vessels and we can see how some of them are really, really abnormal. This is the very center of the retina. So the blood vessels should be nearly not visible at all, but we see them because they are abnormal. And again, they leak in late frames of the angiogram. As the dye test keeps going on, the dye leaks out like I showed you up here. And then we can see areas where there's no blood vessels at all. They are dead because the diabetes killed them. This is the other technique that Kirk was talking to you about, what we call the optical coherence tomography and geography, or CT and geography. And this without dye allows us to see the blood vessels. I must say this technique is very hard to get. So some of my patients try to do their best collaborating with us and we still cannot get the images. So it's not as perfect as hopefully will be in the future. 
So at the moment, it's still hard to get these beautiful pictures, but sometimes we do get them. And with alpha dye, we can see the blood vessels. And we can see areas where there's no blood vessels. They look black rather than seeing the blood vessels like we can here. Here, there's none. They have died away because of the disease. So that's another way in which we can actually evaluate the, the vessels in the back of the eye. So what can we do to treat diabetic macular edema? Well, I told you that there were three risk factors, the high glucose in the blood, the blood pressure being high, the lipids, the cholesterol. So all of that we want to treat because if we treat appropriately, then we would improve the diabetic macular edema and we will reduce actually even the risk of developing it. What else can we do? Well, you heard a lot today about antivascular endothelial growth factor therapies, anti-VEGFs. They are used to treat the leak in age-related macular degeneration. They are, true. they are also used to treat the leak here in diabetic macular edema. We can do macular laser and we can do steroid injections inside the eye. So I'll tell you about each of these quite quickly. So laser, when can we actually treat with laser? Well, Kirk told us that for a wet macular degeneration is not very effective. But for mild forms of diabetic macular edema, it is, it is very effective. And so how do we apply it? With the same system that I showed you, we can use to see the back of the eye. So there's a machine and through this machine, we can deliver the laser with a proper contact lens that goes in contact with the eye. So when we, it's like burning a little bit the retina and that helps the blood vessels to become stronger and to leak less. This is a patient that received treatment many, many years ago. We don't tend to do it like this anymore, but I just, it just kind of like shows you uh, the little scar that we get. It's like a little white area. So those would be fresh burns. Again, this is very confluent. We wouldn't do it like this most of the times nowadays, but it shows the little burns, which is what I wanted to show you. It's interesting because nowadays we have also a different type of laser that is called Sutherishol Micropulse Laser. Sutherishol Micropulse Laser. It's just a different type of laser. What is the typical thing of this laser? Why is this different? Because it doesn't burn the retina. It's interesting. You do it and the retina remains exactly the same. So you don't create any burns. So that is very appealing because the retina stays the same. And actually, there were some studies done, relatively small before, that show that the steel, despite of not producing a burn, it helps strengthening the blood vessels and reducing the fluid in the back of the eye in people with diabetic, diabetic macular edema. What we don't know though, is whether it is better, better than the standard laser. Obviously it would be, if it would be the same, so if it works the same to get rid of the fluid, it would be great because we are not burning the retina. So here um, in the UK and you know, uh, in many places throughout the UK, we are conducting this study, which I'm leading here through Belfast, what we call the diamonds uh, trial, the diabetic macular edema and diode laser treatment for um, diabetic macular edema. So is, uh, we got funding from the government, the, uh, what we call the National Institute for Health Research, uh, the Health Technology Assessment, so NHR funds uh, uh, trials in UK, and we got a good grant to do this multicenter study. What does it mean, multicenter? Well, we have 16 sites across of the UK, and people receive either the standard laser that I showed you that create the burns, or the micropulse uterushole laser that doesn't create the burns. And we are looking at these patients to see whether they do the same or whether one one treatment does better than the other. And we are trying to find out not only whether it works the same, but whether it costs the same, because of course costs are important because we need to pay for all these treatments. And if we can use a cheaper treatment, then we can treat more people or we can treat, treat people with other treatments. So it's always very important. So um, we are comparing, as I say, standard laser with the micropulse uterushole laser. So we have actually completed the trial. So we are just at the stage of evaluating the data. So we should have results of this trial by the end of the year. And then we'll know whether both lasers can be done or whether one is better than the other. When do we use anti VEGFs for our diabetic macular edema? Well, we use them when there's more severe macular edema. If the uh, macular edema is more severe, the laser doesn't work so well. 
and anti-BGFs work better. Now, already Kirk told you about the names of some of these. So we have Lucentis, Ilia, Bastin, Brolukizumab will come soon too for diabetic macular edema. But as we heard, these treatments need to be given monthly. So it is less than ideal for patients. And uh, so if you're squeamish, I'm gonna ask you to look away for the next few seconds, because I want to show you these are given actually as an injection into the eye. So we go to the white part of the eye, we inject the treatment and the treatment goes inside of the eye. So you can look now again back because I'm back to just the next slide. So we, it's been shown that anti-BGFs are better than the laser if people have severe diabetic macular edema. And it seems that all the ones, all the different BGFs are very similar. Anti-BGFs are all very similar. So the, the, their efficacy is very similar on clearing up the diabetic macular edema and improving vision. So however, the trials have shown, the trials that use anti-BGFs have shown that about 50% of patients, so half of the patients, will still require injections five years soon. So this is not a short uh, treatment. It will require years of treatment and people need to be followed closely in the first year, every month, and then maybe every two, three months. But you know, it, it's a lot of work for the NHS and it's a lot of work for the patients that have to receive these injections because they need to keep coming to the clinics. Now in the trials that show that anti-BGFs work for diabetic macular edema, still about half of the patients require laser, meaning they didn't respond fully to the anti-BGFs. There seemed to suggest that there was less progression of the diabetic retinopathy, which might be good, obviously, because then it might reduce the rates of people developing proliferative diabetic retinopathy. We don't know that yet, but that would be great if that were to be the case. And of course, there's potential complications. And Kirk was telling you the infection in the eye, and ophthalmitis is the one that we care the most because it could be the worst one and it could take the sight away of a patient. It happens very unlikely, very, very rarely, but it's still there. We did a study because, of course, the, one of the things that we don't know is how many people respond to these anti-BGFs, how many people with DMO will respond to them. We don't know. And we don't know who is going to respond beforehand. Just the same as Kirk was telling us in H exudative H retinacular degeneration, we start the treatment, but we don't know who is going to respond to it. So we did a study here. We look at 100 uh, patients, consecutive patients with diabetic macular edema that had received anti-BGFs, 140 eyes. And what we show is that the edema, the diabetic macular edema clear completely and fully in the first year of treatment, only in a bit less than a third of the patients. Most of the people, the fluid improved, but it didn't clear totally. That explains why a lot of people require further laser, as I told you in the trials. And there was a group, about 6%, it seems small, but if you think about the number of people that have diabetes, very, very high, so many people have diabetes nowadays. And of course, although diabetic macular edema occurs in very few, because the number of people with diabetes is so high, the number of people with diabetic macular edema is still very high. So even the 6% of non-responders, these are people that did not respond whatsoever. And this, we observed the response after one year of treatment. So if after a year they didn't respond, it's unlikely they're going to respond. But of course they are receiving treatment because we don't know who is going to respond beforehand. So these are examples. This is a patient that responds very nicely. You can see that's the center of the retina, as I showed you before. It goes back to really nearly normal. This is a patient after injections all year round, it remains very much unchanged. So this would be a non-responder. So we cannot tell who is going to respond and who is not. So we did a study here. We had funding by the uh, Medical Research Council, which is another entity that funds research in the UK. It's called a streamline. And what did we do? We did something quite interesting, I think. We took blood from people that responded fully to the anti-BGFs and we took blood from people that did not respond. Well, it's interesting because on the blood, we can isolate cells that fly in the blood vessels in the eye that are moving about in the blood vessels. In, not in the eye, sorry, in the, in the blood. So we took the blood and we isolate these cells. They are called mononuclear cells, but they are cells that are in the blood. 
And with them, we can get what we call stem cells. They are called induced pluripotent stem cells. I'm gonna to refer to them in short stem cells. And once we have the stem cells, it's amazing, but nowadays in a Petri dish in the lab, we can convert them in any cells of the body. So we convert them into cells that lay the blood vessels in the eye, like the blood, but not in the eye, but the blood vessels. So it could be like those cells that lie the blood vessels in the eye. So they are called endothelial cells. And then we put them in the Petri dish. And then we did some studies in the lab to check for how, how they, well they form blood vessels, how well they uh, uh, form sealing. And we saw what was the response in people that responded fully to anti-BGFs and the people that did not respond to anti-BGFs. And we did this without knowing. So the people that were working in the lab, they didn't know whether the blood was coming from full responders or from non-responders. But interestingly enough, the responses in the lab were totally different in responders than non-responders, as if we could, just by looking at this test in the lab, predict who might respond and who might not. That would be great if we could, because then we would only do the treatment to the people that are going to respond best, and we will save all the bother to the others. So at the moment, uh, we are now doing a, 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 we actually did an application, uh, and it's been shortlisted, so we see how it goes, but for funding, because every research needs funding to the NIHR again, to see if we can get funding to do a much larger study to test whether we can actually for sure tell that we can differentiate responders and non-responders with the blood of people before they get the treatment in the lab. So just two words about intravitreal steroids, we can also treat uh, the diabetic macular edema with steroids inside the eye, but we only do it when they don't respond to laser or to anti-BGS because these treatments have more side effects. How about proliferative diabetic retinopathy? This is the other condition I told you that can take away the sight of people that have diabetes. A, uh, well, what is proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Well, in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, abnormal blood vessels grow in the back of the eye. So what is happening is that because of the diabetes, as I was showing you, the blood vessels die in the back of the eye. So if the blood vessels die, the retina gets hungry. They don't, the retina is not getting the nourishment, it's not getting the blood. So it starts sending signals. So like, you know, produce more blood vessels. We need more blood, we need more oxygen, we need more nourishment. So the retina starts producing these blood vessels in an attempt to help, but these blood vessels don't help because these new vessels that we call are very abnormal. And uh, we can see them again when we look in this little lamp as I showed you before, they look like, like a bunch of little lines, red lines. You can see the comparison. This is the normal optic nerve, the normal nerve in the back of the eye. Look, this one, you can hardly see the white because it's all filled with blood vessels. And in fact, you can see now hemorrhage here because these blood vessels have already bled. And when we do the dye test that I showed you before, we can see that this retina has no blood vessels. It looks all black. There's no blood vessels there at all. They are all dead. And then you can see though other areas. So that's what we call ischemia, areas where there's no blood vessels present. And you can see others that actually light up the dye. The dye is coming off. And the dye is coming off because these are the new blood vessels. They also leak the dye, they leak the dye and they leak blood. And what can, what, what can happen is that these new blo abnormal blood vessels, they bleed. Look, this is a very large bleeding here, another bleeding here. They can bleed on the surface of the retina, which is what I'm showing you here, or right inside the eye. We have inside the eye, we have a big cavity. So they can bleed and bleed. And then of course, you cannot see the retina any longer. This patient cannot see out either because of the blood. And the worst thing that can happen too is that these blood vessels bring a scarring with them. And this scarring then contracts and pulls the retina off. And as it pulls the retina off, it detaches the retina and it causes a retinal detachment. And these are very hard to fix surgery with surgery. So what can we do to treat PDR? Again, we try to control the risk factors, the blood pressure, the lipids, the, the, the sugar. We can do laser treatment, it's called palm retinal photocoagulation. We can do surgery. And nowadays, also the anti-BGFs have come to treat proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 
I'm going to go quite quickly through because um, we're still on time. Is that correct? And we're kind of we're couple of minutes over so maybe okay. just, so I'll just yeah, go quite quickly yeah so yeah. again you know we, we have many ways to treat them we do we do uh, surgery for these patients we need to remove scars this is after the uh, uh, surgery as you can see this patient had a very bad detachment again scarring away and you know it, they are very hard to fix we can do lately you know uh, help with uh, anti-VGFs which are very good to treat before the surgery to prevent the hemorrhage occurring during the surgery and after the surgery. None of these treatments though, restore the blood vessels that are lost. So that's the big, the big problem. We are now currently uh, working with, uh, uh, with a grant from, from fighting blindness. We were very happy to get. We are looking into how people with proliferative diabetic retinopathy do after surgery. We see that usually they get successful retinal reattachment, but the visual acuity is usually not so good. And I'm just going to leave it here, actually. I was going to tell you a little bit more about something else, but that's okay. So I'm closing here, uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a million. No, I'm sorry to rush you at the end. But well, that no, was, that's that was okay. great. That's perfect. Yeah. It's really important. If, um, so we don't have too much time for questions, but there was one specific one that just came in um, asking diabetic macular edema is if it's the same as cystoid macular edema just with a different cause? Or? It's not the same. So let me explain. In diabetic macular edema, you can have a cystoid component. What does it mean, cystoid macular edema? It means that in the very center of the retina, we see like little cysts. So you can have diabetic macular edema and at the same time have cystoid edema. But some people have cystoid edema, for instance, after cataract surgery, without having diabetic macular edema. So you can have cystoid macular edema alone without diabetic macular edema. You can have diabetic macular edema alone, but you can have diabetic macular edema, and in addition, have cystoid edema within your diabetic macular edema. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Um, yeah, and if there's any more questions that we might follow up with you, and, um, and we can come back to the people specifically. That's great. Thank, thanks again for joining us, and hopefully- No, thank we'll see you, you very again much. Thank you. Um, so I might just pass over to, before we close the session, um, our research manager, Rachel, is gonna just make a couple of announcements here and then we'll finish up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neve. And thank you, Neve, for all your work on pulling together this webinar. Um, and thank you very much to the speakers uh, this, this evening. Um, I think the fact that we ran over time is pretty testament to the amount of research and um, clinical work that's taking place in these areas, which is great to see. It's also great to see the showcase of the Irish research that's being done. Um, so thank you very much again to the speakers. There's just two things I wanted to quickly note that might be of interest to attendees and people watching the webinar. Um, so Fighting Blindness are hoping in the next few months to start um, a project looking at, at, at the experience of AMD patients and the AMD pathway. So this is something that's in planning stage at the moment, but we're hoping um, we'll have more information in the coming weeks and months. So once we have that, we'll be in contact with our list and through our social media um, outlets, we'll be kind of promoting that. So that's something we're very much excited about. Um, and also um, AMD Awareness Week uh, is due to take place in September of this year. Um, so again, that's something that um, will hopefully be of interest and be an informative week as it always is. Uh, this September. Um, also just to say that many of you um, might be aware of Charles Bonnet syndrome um, and this uh, is being is a project that Fighting Blindness is supporting um, which is led by Dr Alison Reynolds in UCD and um, Dr Reynolds has developed a survey along with her medical student Claire McSweeney um, and some of you may be familiar because it was spoken about at the public engagement day last year and also on some of the previous webinars um, but just to say that the survey is still available for people to take. And what we're going to do is Neve is going to send um, a link to this recording to everybody that's attended this evening. And within that, there'll also be a link to the survey. So if people um, haven't taken the survey or aren't interested in doing that, they can do that by following the link that Neve will send. Um, and we'll also just send on some information on Charles Bonnet syndrome for those people who um, aren't aware of it or if it's the first time hearing it. Um, so Neve will be doing that. Um, also, it's come up a few times that if people have any questions, 
um, it's no problem to contact us at Finding Blindness. And the best way to do that really is by email. So if you email research at findingblindness.ie, that's the best way to get in contact with us. And we can help follow up on any questions that you have um, that might arise out of today's webinar. So with that, then I'd like to close the webinar and thank you, thank everybody for joining um, and spending your evening with us. Um, it looks in Dublin anyway, it's gotten a bit sunny, so hopefully you can get out and enjoy that. Um, and thanks again to our sponsors, Novartis, Roche and Bayer. Um, as Kevin said, without their uh, support, uh, the webinars wouldn't be possible. So yeah, thank you very, everybody. And Eve uh, will be in touch with the link um, to this recording. Thank you.